My name is Mary Walshock. I'm from UC San Diego, and I welcome you on behalf of the San Diego Dialogue and the Mexico Business Center to this Forum Fronterizo. As I said this morning when we opened the session, uh, the San Diego Dialogue over the last four years has really been focusing on cross-border economic development opportunities, and we've tried to be looking out to the future focusing on the life sciences, ag biotech, medical devices, and today, renewable energy. And we feel uh, this focus that we've had over the last four years on cross-border economic development opportunities underscores uh, the reciprocal benefits of living in this very diverse, asset-rich, uh, cross-border region. And so we mean it when we titled this session Renewable Energy, Increasing U.S. Competitiveness Through Cross-Border Alliances. There are many benefits to companies and investors on the U.S. side to our location on the border. The report was authored by Jennifer Green and Andrew McAllister, who are at the California Center for Sustainable Energy. And I think Andrew and Jennifer are here. If any of you wish to speak with them later, yes, raise your hands. And thank you very much. And it was <clears throat> underwritten by the Project Smart Border. Thank you, Steve and Ruben and James, for that support. Uh, it's full of interesting data, and we urge you uh, to take it with you. And if you want additional copies, you can get them off our website. Now. In contemplating how to format a session like this, which again is looking more uh, as much to the future as to what exists today, we wanted to get a keynote speaker who was not only knowledgeable but passionate about issues related to environmental sustainability, clean tech, renewable energy. And we were very fortunate in securing Lieutenant Governor John Garamendi who has a long history of personal and also policy involvement in this region. And we're very glad that you were able to join us. He's on a rush schedule today, so he slipped in quietly as we were all eating lunch, and will slip out quietly as we're all uh, finishing uh, dessert. But we're delighted that you're here. Um, John's focus is going to be on what is happening in California in terms of renewable energy. And we're going to follow his presentation with a wonderful panel discussion on, uh, from three leaders in three renewable energy sectors, wind, um, <clears throat> wind, solar, and geothermal, to help you get a perspective of what's really happening on the ground here. But I'm going to do a brief introduction I don't have to say a lot. Uh, the office makes it easy in that sense. But I do want to highlight that John has had 32 years of public service, including time at the federal and the state levels, notably as Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior during the 1990s, a member of both the California Senate and Assembly, and as California's first elected insurance commissioner, and it was last year that John became the state's lieutenant governor. I've learned through conversations with John that early in his uh, life, he is a graduate of UC Berkeley. Uh, San Diego didn't exist at that time, so he couldn't go to UC San Diego. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he and his wife spent time in Africa, right, in the Peace Corps. So John has a, a wonderful set of perspectives on economic and community development that I fit, think fit very nicely with our focus today. Uh, knowing that this topic is near and dear to his heart, we did approach him and he agreed to speak. And I just would like to remind all of you that, that John over the years has worked on a variety of renewable energy issues on water issues, the safe disposal of nuclear waste, funding mass transit projects, that's infrastructure, and importantly, finding ways to address climate change. And so we are delighted that you are here. Uh, Mary, thank you so very much. And for all of you that are here, thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in this issue of uh, renewables, and just as importantly, the issue of Mexico and California relationships. Uh, here in San Diego, the relationship between Baja 
I should say here in San Diego and Imperial County, to my friends in Imperial, uh, the relationship between these two southern counties of California and with Baja Mexico, it's extremely important. We share so much. We share so much good and we share some common problems. And today we're going to talk about uh, one of those, uh, and that is energy issues. Uh, last night uh, there was this little presidential debate that perhaps you may have seen. Um, and coming up in that debate often was this issue of national security. And I talk about back and forth Iraq, Afghanistan, and back and forth. But I want to put national security in the context of energy. Because I think above, uh, along with all of these international wars and the like, the issue of energy is one of the fundamental national security issues that we face, not only here in California and in the United States, but similarly in Mexico and really throughout the world. Any country that wants to talk about national security is going to have to talk about energy. And we need to do this in a couple of ways. One is, where are we going to get our energy? Now, in the United States, we've been talking about energy independence ever since Jimmy Carter was president and OPEC turned off the valve and we go, nope. And we had a big thirst for energy in the 1970s. And we started off, we were doing a lot of things. Uh, in fact, in that period of time, 1978, I carried the very first solar, wind, and conservation tax credits here in the state of California together with Assemblyman Gary Hart. And there was similar legislation in Washington, D.C. And then we forgot about it when oil went down to $10 a barrel and we went on our way just gulping oil. And here we are once again. It turns out that we get our oil from the most dangerous places in the world, right? Uh, let's see, how about the Middle East, uh, Russia, Venezuela, and uh, we should probably include in this the Gulf of Mexico, which every time there's a little storm, we lose a third of our energy production. So these are dangerous places for a variety of reasons, but in terms of national security, we need to realize that this energy issue is a fundamental national security issue. In that context, in the political, the macroeconomic sense, in geopolitics. It's also a critical issue in the very future of our planet because the energy that we're consuming here in the United States is energy that is produced almost entirely by carbon-based fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, and the rest, creating a rather severe climate problem. Now, there may be some of you in this room that are not believers in greenhouse gas and climate change. I'll have a conversation with you outside in the woodshed after this is over. <laughs> but this is a real issue. And I happened to have studied this uh, when I was at the Department of Interior. It was my responsibility at the Department of Interior, together with four other deputy secretaries in um, defense, commerce, treasury, uh, and agriculture to work with three of the national agencies, NOAA, NASA, and the environmental agencies, to prepare the American agenda for the Kyoto Conference. And I was responsible for studying the land now. We're responsible for having the men and women in the Department of Interior study the land, the water, the terrestrial uh, issues. Not good. And that was 1994, 95, that we were doing this. Since that time, the information that we used has been upgraded to the point of serious, serious problems. For California, we're talking about a very serious problem. And I should say also for Baja, California, uh, we expect the um, snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains to be 30 to 70 percent less. And for our friends from Baja, the snow in the Rocky Mountains to be 30 to 70 percent less. Therefore, the Sacramento River system and the Colorado River system Big, big problem for all of us. Less water. How do we deal with that? All of it comes back, in my view, to where do we get our energy? How are we going to do this? Fortunately, here in the South, whether it's Baja, San Diego, or Imperial, there is incredible energy resources available to us. Now, we have to figure out how are we going to harvest these renewable energy resources. And it's possible for us to do it. 
And that's what this conference is about. That's what you're going to be discussing today. And let me just get you started. First of all, the report that, Mary, you talked about, excellent report. It's concise, it's to the point, it covers almost all of the ground, and I recommend you read it. I'm going to get my coffee and sit down. <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. But let me just uh, highlight a few things, some of it in the report and some of it just some of my own observations on it. Uh, first of all and foremost is conservation. People that have looked at this issue over time have come to the same conclusion over and over again. This goes back to the 70s. The single biggest source of new energy is to conserve what we have. Now, we've made a lot of progress in California, and we should take pride in that. The per capita consumption of energy in California has remained flat since the 70s, even though we have significantly grown our population. The good news is we did that. The bad news is we're still consuming far, far more energy. The California Public Utility Commission last week uh, published, actually published and approved a major blueprint on how to achieve greater energy efficiency. And I'd recommend that to our neighbors in, uh, to the south because it is a terrific blueprint. It lays out in very clear language and by sector and cross sectors the things that can be done, indeed must be done, to conserve energy. Energy efficiency, energy efficiency on the farm, energy efficiency in water, in housing, commercial development, and in transportation. Well, they really didn't deal with transportation. Anyway, that is a terrific blueprint. So like most blueprints, what are you going to do with it? Well, we better build something. That's what you do with the blueprint. And we need to get at this right away uh, because it is the single fastest and best way to deal with energy production or en the conservation of energy. Some things that are there require implementation. That implementation will certainly be in the private sector as we build houses, as we build commercial structures, and as, and this is important, and as we renovate existing buildings. I've had some discussion with the University of California about this. The leadership university, not exactly the leadership in going green in its buildings. And so a few kicks and pushes along the way, and they're beginning to get the message. Uh, one of the things that's important here for those of you in government is to be aware that the budget for capital outlay and the budget for ongoing operations need to be merged so that the life cycle cost of a project is taken into account. Not often done, so heads up for the university, for the state university system, for government operations, Private sector pretty much does that already. They go, oh, what's it going to cost me to build it? What's it going to cost me to operate? But in government, we've got two completely different budgets. So we need to merge those things if we're going to achieve energy efficiency in the largest single sector of our economy, which is the government sector. We've got two and a half million Californians on the college campuses. And then you add to that the high school, the community colleges, and the rest, and we've got a lot to do here. So, Energy conservation, it's going to require local government, state government, cities, counties, and the nation to carry this out. We've got to coordinate our policies. They have to be brought together. Uh, on the renewable side, hey, this area is ahead of most other areas, perhaps in the entire world. In these two counties and in Baja, Mexico, almost all of the renewables that you would want to look at are available in very, very large qualities, quantities and quality. Um, perhaps as much as 47,000 megawatts of renewable power are available in this area. It doesn't mean it's all going to get done and certainly not going to get done immediately, but it is there. Geothermal, big time geothermal over in Imperial. You're going to talk about that and all of the uh, good successes you're going to have in putting together the geothermal over there. Our friends from uh, Imperial, I'm sure the County Board of Supervisors are happy to grant the permits and get on with it. Um, a lot, a lot of, uh, of renewable power in the area of which geothermal is a huge part of it. The sun does shine here in the south, right? And it really shines over in the 
Imperial County area, perhaps uh, as much as uh, 36,000 megawatts of solar power available. A lot of that's going to be found in solar thermal, which incidentally started in 1979 and 80 here in the California desert up in the Mojave area with a company whose name was Luce. It's been morphed into a new company that's back to build some new solar power plants out in the uh, Barstow area. But these solar thermal power plants are real. They're going to come online and they add enormous potential for us. Wind, the wind does blow, and distributed solar power is going to be found on most rooftops. PV systems, you're going to have a discussion about that from one of your, um, from Kiosera, I guess you're going to be participating here. Uh, that's an enormous opportunity. I was sharing with uh, a, our Kiosera representative a moment ago that I actually own a Kiosera solar cell. It's on our cabin out in the woods where there's no electricity and we put it up with two batteries and now I got a little light I can turn it on. It's terrific. My children have 20 panels and they put it on their house and they're using a program called the net metering program to power their house and their electric bills for the two houses run about twenty dollars a month. So there is opportunity here. One thing that I don't see in the report for the writers of the report is what I call distributive solar thermal. Used to be that most rooftops in sunny areas had on a solar water heating system. Now once you get heating and air conditioning out of the way, the next single biggest use of power in a home is hot water. So where's the solar thermal panel on the roof? We want to add that to the list of things that need to be done. What does all of this mean? What it means in terms of national security ought to be obvious and ought to be important to all of us. If we can wean ourselves from dependence on foreign oil, wherever it may be coming from, and natural gas, we become energy independent. It also means a huge number of jobs. Perhaps in this region as many as 200,000 new jobs in the manufacturing. And that's manufacturing is going to take place on this side of the border, but I think most of it's going to be on the other side of the border. The Montelador and other programs already in place. There's a huge new power um, plant going in in uh, the Mexicali area to uh, do thin film uh, solar photovoltaic. So these opportunities are there on the manufacturing side. And then there's the installation and the maintenance. The wind turbines that uh, Semper wants to put up in the mountains uh, to the east and south of here, somebody's going to have to climb up in that huge machine and maintain it. So you're talking about mechanics, you're talking about machinists, electricians, and others who will be responsible for not only installing but maintaining these systems. It is the green collar jobs of the future. And it is incredibly important to the state of California and to Mexico. Those jobs are viable, they're already in place, and they will be there in the future as we transition to these renewable systems. Um, the other part of it, if we're going to make this work, is we're going to have to have training programs. These are new jobs. These are new things that we don't presently do. And it's not just in the wind turbines. You're going to have to train those mechanics. You're going to have to train the electricians. It's also in the transportation system. I own a Prius hybrid. I don't take that down to the little corner mechanic in my little town of Walnut Grove of 600 people. He doesn't quite have the knowledge to deal with that new technology. And interestingly enough, many shops don't. Whether they're here in Mexico, as we move to these hybrids, as we move to these new methods of moving ourselves, we're going to have to retrain our mechanics and uh, technicians at these centers. How do we do that? Well, we don't do it with this year's state budget in California. <laughs> Not going to happen, folks. Governor Schwarzenegger started uh, appropriately the uh, career technical education programs. We call that, uh, it's a new name for vocational education, to train the mechanics, the electricians, the carpenters, and so forth. This year's budget has $53 million less than it did last year for this kind of program in our community colleges and high schools. So we're seeing a diminution of what was already a minimal program. We have to ramp that up. And it's also an issue for Mexico. These two um, 
countries, economies, at least here in the South, are integrated. And the workforce moves back and forth across the border. So this training issue is exceedingly important. Fortunately, San Diego County has one of the best community college training programs in the state. And it's to be recommended. If you're not yet engaged in that, and not your companies are not connected to it, you should connect. Because the viability and the vitality of those training programs is enhanced when the businesses are directly involved. Enhanced for two ways. One, the students are specifically trained for the needs of the employer. And the employer winds up assisting in providing money or uh, facilities for those training programs. A very, very important thing. So I should probably ask you to raise your hand if you're involved with a community college in a training program. All right, let's get with it, folks. <laughs> well, only one of two of you raised your hands. This is really, really, okay, three. <laughs> it's really important because that's where the training takes place and there are many things that can be done on that. That's a subject of another speech at another time. What else do we need to do this? How are we going to make this happen, this transition? Uh, in addition to the training, the research that we need to have taking place at the universities and other places, very important. We also have to have consistent and strong public policy. Unfortunately, we've not had that. I mentioned 1970s, start, stop on moving towards renewable energy just didn't happen. Now's the time. We don't have any other option. Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know how you're going to say this, as part of the Wall Street bailout, the federal investment tax credit for solar and wind was put in place. We're thankful for that. And we're also thankful that they paid for it by removing some of the subsidies from the oil industry and moving them over to renewables. Good public policy. However, that's just the start. Here at the state level, we have many different programs in place. We've got to keep these programs viable. We have to pay for this. We're going to have to find the money in the budgets or through the PUC to pay for these programs. There are a lot of them out there. The California Solar Initiative, the California Self-Generation Initiative, uh, the Renewable Portfolio Standards, the Federal Tax Investment Tax Credit, uh, feed-in tariffs, and cap-and-trade systems. All of these are f governmental policies, and they are profoundly important to the transition to renewables. Without these policies, the chances of the, we actually moving to the renewable and dealing with this security issue is not good. So we need strong, dependable, consistent public policy over time. Many different programs have to be put in place. Uh, secondly, in a governmental sector, we need regional cooperation. Now we have what is called the Western Climate Initiative, which involves um, British Columbia, Oregon, Washington, California, and uh, Baja California is an observer in this program, and we'd like to see that ramped up so that we have the entire West Coast, at least as far as the southern tip of Baja and all the way up to um, Alaska, covered in the Western State or the Western Climate Initiative. It's going to be a very important mechanism to deal with uh, cap and trade programs and the integration of the various. Uh, transmission of energy systems as well as knowledge. All of these things are possible. It's all possible. And in addition to being possible, it is absolutely essential that we transition our energy supplies from where we are today, which is still coal and oil, natural gas, carbon-based fuels, to renewables. We can do it. We've got incredible research available to us, research in how to upgrade the photovoltaic systems, how to do the solar thermal, how to advance the concentration of solar energy so that you get more efficiency out of photovoltaic or solar thermal. New techniques and technologies in dealing with geothermal. All of that is happening. We're doing some incredible research now on biofuels in what I call the slime fields, otherwise known as algae. You know, the things that we can do, and all of these are viable, uh, if we are willing to put our economic future into this specific area. 
I don't think we have any choice but to do this. That's my personal opinion, and that's what I hope you will leave this meeting with, that, yeah, it can be done. We can build a strong regional economy here in Southern California, along the border, strong for Baja, enormous jobs, research, manufacturing, installation. On that side of the border, as much as we do it on this side of the border, 200,000 job potential, providing excess energy more than would be consumed in this region to be exported to those folks up north in Orange County and Los Angeles. <laughs> it's possible. And in doing so, we enhance the economy and we secure our security. So that's what's on our future. You're going to have a wonderful group here in a few moments talking about the specific details on how their companies are doing it, what they need. Public policy. Public policy is going to be the foundation upon which this is built. Public policy, strong incentives, the research, the education, the preparation, the financing. I didn't go into that, but there's a lot of venture capital money available for new technologies. There's also a little problem right now for project financing. Right, gentlemen? <laughs> yeah. But Wall Street is going to be bailed out and life will go on, right? We have an enormous potential here. And in doing so, we're going to create a much, much stronger economy and a much better world for our grandchildren and the generations beyond. Thank you so very much. Thank you for doing this conference. My name is Andy Horn. I'm with Imperial County. And you know, I work with a, I, I sit on a statewide panel dealing with energy transmission, and we keep referring to something called the Garamendi Principle. The Gar now I know where it came from. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, I was uh, trying to remember when I authored that law. I, I was, well, maybe, you could, maybe you could enlighten us. No, I don't want to hear about that. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> but, but transmission in general is something you didn't really uh, uh, touch on uh, to a great extent, and yet transmission for us at least, down in remote areas, because unfortunately some of these renewable resources are located away from the load centers, is important to moving these products to market, just like highways and railroads and everything else. So I was wondering if you had some thoughts that you might share with us about how we're going to address that, because there are a lot of environmental barriers set up and policy barriers set up to, you know, limit the amount of new infrastructure that can be built, like energy transmission. Well, you, you've raised a major issue and a very, very sensitive one here in San Diego and Imperial County. The Sunrise issue, probably that's what's on your mind and the genesis of the question. Um, yeah, long, long ago, I was trying to remember what year I must have authored a law that had to do with transmission and the preferences to use existing corridors. Uh, now, here's where the trade, in all of this, there's a trade-off. There is no pure, best, absolute good way of doing any of this. Every one of these things, whether it's coal or oil or any of the uh, alternative energies, all have a downside. Every one of them. And the question is one of trade-offs. And with many of my environmental friends, I like to consider myself an environmental person, uh, we've got to accept trade-offs. It doesn't do much good to put a uh, wind farm in a remote location and not have an extension cord to the city. You're going to have to do that. And uh, we've seen this in the Tehachapi situation, a three-year delay in the building of the Tehachapi uh, wind farms in trying to get an extension cord from the wind farm into uh, Los Angeles Basin. Obviously, there's an issue here with the Sunrise uh, link, and that has to be addressed. I understand that uh, that continues on. I won't go into all the detail, although I'm very familiar with it. Um, we will have to build a link from Imperial to the cities. And one question, and I actually asked a PUC commissioner this two days ago. I said, as near as I can tell, the Imperial Irrigation District has a major power line on the east side of the Salton Sea that does somehow connect into the urbanized areas of Southern California. Has that been considered? Well, not really. So these questions, I know, are going to be before the PUC for a decision, and the sooner that decision is made, the better for all of us. We need to get on with it. I have my own preference uh, to how to solve this problem. 
And it goes back to that bill I carried. And in this particular case, I don't like going through a state park. I think there's other options available to us. Okay? I think I'd better leave it there since I marched into some sensitive territory. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. Our three speakers today are Alberto Abreu, who is a project development uh, director at Sempra Energy, who's going to be talking about wind energy. Uh, Cecilia Aguillon is going to be in her seat in just a moment. She's a Director of Market Development and Government Affairs for Kyocera, and uh, it's her company that's heating John Garamendi's family's homes. And our third panelist is Brian Harms, who is General Manager of the Imperial Valley Operations of a very large technology company, Ormat Technologies, that's working in the geothermal space. So I'm going to ask each of you and we'll start with Alberto. And uh, uh, Cecilia, you can join in the third chair. And we're just going to do quick introductions. Because not everybody's sophisticated about what your companies are doing. Could we just start by you describing the technology space in which you're working in renewables? And Alberto, you start, and then Brian, and then Cecilia. OK. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Alberto Abreu. I work for Sempre Generation. Sempre Generation is uh, developing renewable projects in the solar, wind, and um, biomass areas of renewable energy. I'm Brian Harms. I'm the general manager for Ormat's Imperial Valley operations, where we actually operate geothermal uh, power generation facilities. Uh, Ormat is a vertically integrated company that uh, builds, designs, actually constructs and operates geothermal and re uh, recovered energy uh, power generation equipment. Okay. And Cecilia, perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I work for Kyocera Solar Inc. and I'm a, a marketing development and government uh, relations representative and I, we are the, uh, one of the leading manufacturers of so, so photovoltaic solar cells and modules, and uh, we are globally, basically. Now, the first question I, I want to ask is that I think a lot of people have felt that all of these environmental technologies are kind of dreams about the future, are sort of pie in the sky. But do you feel that in terms of the energy space in which you're working, we've kind of reached a tipping point where there's really a growing market demand and the potential to scale up and to actually make money and create jobs in the energy space in which you're working. And I'd like to hear from each of you in terms of, and we'll start with Alberto. Okay. Uh, Semper Generation's entry into the renewable uh, energy space is a result of increasing public policy uh, endeavors that have gone on, like the renewable mandates. Um, sensitivities about, of from the public around environmental issues and a desire to have our power be brought in by uh, cleaner energy sources. Um, as states pursue these kinds of things, we think the demand for renewable energy is going to increase and it's going to be a substantial market. For SEMPRA, uh, we have a lot of experience in the southwest. We have a lot of experience in Mexico developing power plant projects. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a lot of experience in developing big energy projects, and that is our niche. That's what we're really good at. <clears throat> and given that the area in northern Mexico and in the southwest is, an, is a very good area for wind and solar resource that allows us to develop big projects, that is a perfect fit for us. And we think it's a long-term market for us, otherwise we wouldn't be in it. Our first two efforts that we've, in, we've gotten into, uh, that we have announced, are the Energia Sierra Juarez uh, project. It's a wind project in the area of La Rumorosa, which is about 20 or 30 miles, or yeah, 20 or 30 miles east of Tecate, uh, Mexico. And a 10 megawatt project that we're building near our existing El Dorado energy plant in Nevada, which is a thin film solar uh, project, 10 megawatts. 
So we think it's a we think it's a long-term play. We think that there's plenty of opportunity there for us uh, with incentives and whatnot. Uh, we think that there is a a reasonable return to be had for us, and that's why we're in the space. Ryan. Well, I, I think the social acceptance of renewable energies has has reached the point where now geothermal and solar and, and wind and, and other technologies are no longer on the fringes of, of our power generation. They're actually developing into mature, acceptable technologies that are becoming cost effective uh, due to the increase in cost of natural gas and, and, uh, and other carbon sources. Um, as for the uh, things like production tax credits, which for many of our projects are, are necessary for their viability, we're starting to see at least a that becoming more acceptable at a federal level so that they get extended. I would like to see, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, more, more long-term uh, planning for energy needs so that we can do uh, projects and make long-term financial plans. Um, financing entities, uh, putting aside the recent uh, volatility in financial markets, have actually become more favorable for, uh, for renewable generation. Again, as I said, we're no longer a fringe type of activity is actually something that's necessary, driven by social acceptance, renewable portfolio standards, uh, and just a general public uh, interest in trying to uh, find alternative sources that address our energy needs. Cecilia, yeah, you were uh, with a big company. Yeah, and I, I, short answer is absolutely. Uh, yeah. We are at the tipping point, if not going, um, you know, just at the right spot. I'm just going to talk about solar energy because that's what we do. And uh, this, it's not new really. I mean, we've been doing solar energy since 1975, it's Kyocera. And uh, we know it's a proven technology. It's used uh, in space. It's used uh, out there in the middle of nowhere where there is no ener uh, uh, electric grid. And the market actually for the cities and the on-grid market, which is the fastest growing globally, that actually started in 1994 in Japan. And this is when the price of oil was very cheap and natural gas, but what they, di what they did was they saw into the future and they wanted to create a market, not necessarily take care of the uh, potential looming energy problem, which we are very grateful for because if I had not they s taken that step, we probably wouldn't be here today. So their market over 10 years, don't talk about long term, their policy was a 10-year program, which is what California has done too, and um, incentives going down to zero. And within that space of 10 years, 94 to 2004, the prices of PV went down by 70%. And that allowed now the European markets to get in. So now Europe, obviously, is the, the, they have the largest market in the world with uh, uh, Germany number one. Germany has the solar hours of Alaska. And number two was Japan for a long time with the solar hours of Seattle. Now this year, Spain came in and took out Japan in the number, one, the number two position. So there is a, a friendly competition going mm -hmm. on, and this is globally. Now if you look at Europe and you look at the US, we have the best resources for solar energy. So we are positioned to be the number one by far. But we are not there yet. Just to, to compare, uh, Germany installed over 4 gigawatts, 4,000 megawatts of PV already. And we in California at about 200 uh, megawatts. And we are the third, we were now the fourth largest market in the world. So we have a lot of catching up to do, but everything is in place to get it done. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Garamendi talked about policy and how important he felt it was. I mean, he's a career government guy, so of course he's interested in policy. But I'm curious, as business people, what are the sorts of policies that enable or inhibit uh, your industry moving forward, and particularly within California as well as nationally? And again, if you don't mind beginning, Alberto. Sure. Uh, as a general matter, uh, for renewable energy projects, what we need is adequate electric infrastructure, in other words, transmission, as was pointed out by the folks at Imperial County. Um, we need to have the ability to import this power to the load centers because renewable energy projects obviously have to go to where the energy source is, and those typically are in remote areas. Uh, and typically there isn't robust transmission systems in those locations. 
so we need to, to recognize the fact that if we want to have more renewable, we have to have the ability to transmit that power to the load centers. The other area where, uh, from a policy perspective, that I, that I think needs to be recognized is the, the cost of these renewable energy projects are generally coming down. However, without the incentives that are provided by tax credits and these other things, mandates, renewable mandates and whatnot, these projects would not provide a reasonable return to investors like us. And so those kinds of projects need to be made permanent uh, and, and looked at a little bit perhaps more holistically in terms of providing a viable way for people to invest their money and get a reasonable return. Well, I think that uh, policies are good for setting the tone and for basically doing just that, bringing the public along with the concept. But there's underlying things, as my, my colleague mentioned, with transmission that, that have to be in place. The policy only begins things. For us to bring a power plant online, it has to be permitted. Electrical inter infrastructure was mentioned, transmission, and I'm not going to belabor that point. Water is another one. California has a number of areas that have problems with water and competing demands for it. Our technologies, as well as some others that were mentioned, such as thermal solar, require a large amount of water. So that needs to be considered because as a, that becomes a trade-off. Permitting, depending on uh, the level of proficiency of uh, local agencies, we are expert at uh, designing and building power plants. We can bring a power plant online in 11 months from breaking ground. There's very few people in the world that can do that. However, to move that fast, we need agencies to be essentially as fast as we are, as efficient as we are uh, at, at building a power plant that infrastructure is, is going to be essential for us to move quickly. For my, te yes, yeah. sir. For my technology, since you know, we don't really, uh, our solar panels are best when put, uh, installed right at the point of use. So transmission and water are not our main concerns, but what are our main concerns? Because we are at the distribution point on your roofs and near your loads, we, uh, net metering is essential for us. Uh, in the state of California, we have a, uh, a problem that, you know, the net metering is, uh, will hit a, a cap. In San Diego, for example, is 50 megawatts, and we have installed 43. So, um, you know, very soon we have to go back to the legislature and ask for net metering lifting. Uh, in places like in Japan or in Florida now, we, net metering doesn't have a cap, meaning that you can install as many systems as you want in a utility territory with no... Um, no, no uh, um, ceiling. Um, so that is very important. We have to have it. If we don't have it, I can give you away a system, but if you cannot net meter, you know, you're, uh, you're not getting the full benefit. So, and the other one is the permitting. It's very, very frustrating that in California, every municipality, every city, they have different um, costs for uh, uh, permitting the uh, uh, PV panels on, on homes. In some cities, it's zero. In some cities, it's $2,000, $1,200 for permits. So that cuts into the economics of the system. So, um, and, and then the other one is the long term, knowing that you know, we have a program that lasts. And in, in our case, we're not really asking for you know, subsidies that never end. We're asking for a schedule of subsidies that will end so that the systems can be you know, purchased like you purchase an air conditioner. Could she explain what net metering is? Net metering may need be explained. Okay. <laughs> net meter is, is when you install a PV system on your roof and you connect it to your side of the meter so that when the sun is shining, you, you, your panels are providing uh, your home first with the energy it needs and if you're not using enough of it, then the excess energy will go back into the grid and it will be shared with the neighbors. So your meter runs, runs backwards. And then at nighttime, so you're, you're accumulating a credit. At nighttime, when you come home and turn on the lights, then your meter runs forwards because you're taken for the, from the grid. At the end of the month, you either have a credit if it's you know, in the summertime um, or you have to pay. If you have a credit, you hold that credit until the end of the year when it's true up and then you either have a, you know, just free energy that you give away 
to utility or uh, you have to pay the difference, the net. One of the other things the Lieutenant Governor alluded to is how the shifting economic uh, conditions in the last few weeks, and particularly the crisis in the credit markets, might be affecting the future of renewables because you were all new, if not new technologies, many of you are developing new enterprises and new capabilities. Are, do you think your industry is going to be affected by what's been happening in the uh, global economy and in the credit markets? Uh, fortunately for me, there's people at Sempra that get paid more money than I do to worry oh. about the credit markets. So, uh, near as I can tell, it, it hasn't had any effect on our development projects, but other people get to worry about that. Brian? Format also has employees that are better paid than oh, me okay. and more expertise. <laughs> But I, I it thought does. you were the business people, not the politicians. <laughs> You're making very political <laughs> responses. But it, it will have an impact on our projects, uh, not such that it'll, it will prevent them from going forward. Um, essentially, there are financial uh, players that maybe are not as uh, readily available or accessible to us. The other thing is the uh, remaining players that still want to participate in renewable generation are tending to evaluate risk. Uh, with a higher level of scrutiny, which basically means although it won't impact our projects from a financing availability, there is most likely going to be costs that are going to be higher associated with these changes. For me, um, we don't install, pro we don't, uh, not the installers of the projects, but talking to the installers, I really have not seen anything that would say that, you know, they will have a lot of problems, maybe in the residential area. Um, you know, might be an issue, but uh, yet we haven't seen it. One thing about that, and I think Lieutenant Governor talked about all this uh, investor, uh, venture capitalist money, is that um, because, you know, solar energy is, is very basic, the panel, there are no moving parts, the panel, the sun hits the panel, produces energy. So in Germany, for example, um, there's, a, there's been a billions and billions of euros in investment, and the investor community feels very safe because as long as the sun shines, mm -hmm. then you know you're going to get a return on your investment. If the sun stops shining, I think that return on investment is the least of your worries. <laughs> I'd like to ask one final question of each of you and then throw it open for some discussion with the audience. And that has to do with this cross-border region. You're all working in companies that draw on the resources of both regions and would really like to know your perspective on what are the benefits and what are the challenges of working in the cross-border region in the renewable space. Uh, for Semper Energy, we work on both sides of the border. We, uh, the border is more of an imaginary thing to us in, in that sense than, than anything else. We have large projects in Mexico, the LNG project the, uh, in it, north of Ensenada. We have our gas pipeline. We have an existing power plant that's in Mexico that exports power to the United States. Our wind project in that area is also going to export most of its power likely to the United States. We're very comfortable with the region uh, working in it. The, what, what, what we see in it is it, it broadens the ability to uh, build projects and provide energy resources to the area because you're not just limited by a certain geographical area. You actually expanded that geographical area to the southern portion and, and east and west in the United States. So um, we think we're uniquely positioned really in that sense in, in this uh, renewable energy space for this sort of development, sort of binational development. Brian? Well, in our position in the Imperial Valley, we're located there primarily because that's where the geothermal resource is mm -hmm. that we need. Uh, being close to the border, we don't really work across the border in any way. It's just the nature of our business. Although um, the Imperial Valley is, is a relatively rural area, but I do need access to employees. And actually, I, I do look south of the border and have a number of my staff, uh, skilled staff, that actually come back and forth uh, across the border uh, from Mexicali uh, on a regular basis. We have been very for fortunate that uh, Kyocera uh, located uh, Mexicaladora on the other side of the border prior to the solar boom, so that when we were looking for a manufacturing facility, you know, our maquila was already there. We had the space, we had everything. So 
um, we are being there is fantastic for us because we are close to the largest uh, North American market mm -hmm. and uh, to the most untapped best solar resources in North America as well, which is San Diego. And I mean untapped because we only, we're only about 10% of the market and so we have a, a, a lot of room. Um, also, in terms of that, um, the technology is very uh, diverse in terms of uh, jobs and resources, meaning that um, you can be here or there and you can still use the, you know, the schools available, the resources available for training and, and so on, if you have uh, programs that are on both sides of the border and that's at all levels. Hmm. I cut off a lot of questions uh, from the Lieutenant Governor, and we have about 10 minutes if you have questions of our panelists or comments. Um, we'll, let, we'll start with Phil Blair, the President of the Board of the Chamber of Commerce. The microphone and everything here. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic, and we've been hearing about it for years, and think, plants being built and things happening. And When do you see a noticeable change in the trajectory of the use of oil and natural gas and coal that it starts leveling off or going down because of some renewable energy source that really starts to make a difference. Are we still 10 years off or 10 months off? How far away before we really start to see the effect of your industries on our foreign use, foreign oil usage? Maybe I can give a sort of a broad perspective since we're looking at multiple types of renewable sources. Uh, a cost to build a combined cycle, a natural gas fired combined cycle plant is about $1,500 a kilowatt. The cost to build a wind project is something like $2,500 a kilowatt. And the cost to build a solar project is somewhere around 3,500, give or take, I mean, rough numbers. Clearly renewable energy, and I found out today that it's $4,000 for geothermal. I didn't know that. So the renewable energy is not cheap. It's expensive to build. Uh, your energy source obviously is a little bit less expensive. Where we see things changing a little bit is probably in the solar area where solar panels probably could come down in price over time as more and more of these things are built and more and more players come in into the construction, into the building of solar panels. Wind projects uh, probably will also come down. Right now we're at a little bit of a peak in terms of cost for wind turbines because there's so much demand at the moment. Players have come in, raised the price of, of turbines, not to mention the, just the commodity prices of steel and whatnot having gone up and transportation expenses and that sort of thing. Um, but those prices we think will come down as more and more players jump into the, the manufacturing business of building turbines and, um, and, and as commodity prices stabilize and whatnot, I think we'll see a reduction in prices of that as well. Where those prices are going to equilibrate or, and when, it's really hard to say. That's why I mentioned before that some of these tax credits and whatnot are still needed and are probably going to be needed for the reasonably foreseeable future, at least, to uh, make these projects viable from an economic standpoint. Cecilia, you had a comment? Oh, yeah. No, just that. I think that it's coming. Uh, no question. Because, um, you know, now you have GM coming out with an electric vehicle. Uh, Tesla is here in California, and like the gentleman from Sempra said, you know, th we are really rushing as, as fast as we can to grid parity, meaning that the, uh, reducing the cost of the uh, uh, solar, so that a lot, what a lot of people like to do is buy an electric vehicle, plug it in uh, in their home, and then I think that that's going to be a trend that is going to uh, catch on. And so I, I, 10 years, very reasonable for me. A question here from John McNeese. On the comparative pricing between um, a hydrocarbon uh, power plant versus solar, wind, uh, geothermal, obviously once you build the plant for hydrocarbons, you've got to purchase the hydrocarbons, whereas with the others, you don't have uh, the, the cost of the, the feedstock or the fuel. Um, so when you approach it that way, at what price of fuel do they become comparable? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Another question? So, I, I can say this. The, the current, the current uh, pricing of, of fuels is such that it's, well, two weeks ago maybe or three weeks ago, now that it's down to, down to $80 or whatever it is today, it's no longer quite as much. But we were getting to a point where, where we were getting s relatively close to, to that sort of level of equilibrium. Coal, however, is still yes. relatively cheap, uh, even though it has increased in price in, in recent years. But generally, uh, uh, the carbon-based plants, you mentioned combined cycle plants, they're operating. It's not just a matter of what the cost of the fuel is. It's what the price that's being paid for the generation. So you're working off of what is called in the industry a spark spread, uh, what the cost of the electricity is relative to the fuel, and calculate that with the efficiency. Does the plant, is it viable? That really doesn't work for us. We, we finance our projects on a long-term basis for a fixed price. There's some formulas in there for time of use, but generally it's a fixed price with an escalator over a period of time. And we have to project long-term whether we can operate that or not, regardless of what happens to the cost of natural gas or the cost of oil. Uh, so our, our model is a little bit different than a, than a combined cycle plant. So I'm not sure there is a specific price where it crosses over. Any other questions or comments? There's, the lights are bright, so I may be missing people. If not, I think it is appropriate for me to thank the three of you for giving us insight. <laughs>